can't believe we've reached our final session uh, and roads uh, final final uh, final finalist presentation so um, we have as I uh, shared on slack um, and I'm going to share my screen now um, we have three great finalist teams so a big congratulations to team two 19 and 23 and a big congratulations and thank you I, I know I already said this during the break to all the teams I mean they were all so great and I'm not just saying that um, you know I it was a very short time frame and a big ask and you guys delivered and you did it well you did it creatively and thoughtfully so thank you so much for all your hard work on these end road projects so here is how this is going to go. So we're going to give each team uh, two minutes to do kind of a lightning round overview of uh, their scenario so that um, we can, you know, if you haven't had a chance to see their video, um, you, can, you can know what they're about. Um, and then we'll open it up to a discussion led by Sally Benson and Drew Jones. Um, uh, and, and uh, involving all of you where we can talk to each of the teams about uh, what they were thinking, their work. We'll then open it up to a vote. It'll be kind of a five minute vote, vote slash break that Jenny will lead us on. Um, and just to be clear, uh, everybody in this Zoom can vote, um, including the finalist teams. So uh, it'll be done through a Zoom poll. And then we'll announce the winner, have a kind of a wrap up, um, both on En-ROADS and the course. So since uh, everything about this week has been very online and technical, I have devised a very non-technical way of randomizing which team goes first. Uh, so I will uh, draw the team number and then give that team two minutes to, uh, to give, us, give us their spiel. So, uh, excuse me, the first team will be team 19. Hello everyone. It's been a pleasure getting to know such a diverse and knowledgeable group of people this week. And many thanks to Kate, Jenny, Drew, and the rest of the Energy at Stanford and Climate Interactive team for this amazing program. Our group is the 19th lever. En-ROADS gives you 18 levers that are supposed to maneuver many different aspects of environmental and energy policy, but we believe that they omitted the most important 19th lever on the human initiative that provides a guiding influence on global energy policy. So we added it in. We applied the 19th lever and focused on three major guiding principles. We believe that climate change is a global initiative, and we want to focus on measures that like the Paris Agreement, truly involve 195 out of 195 countries, rather than selectively picking winners and losers. We also are bullish on technology, and especially on promoting advancements in existing technology over hoping for breakthroughs in new technologies. Finally, we believe that there's no free lunch nor magic bullet. Our plan will have winners and losers, especially in the short term, and we believe that losers can only be compensated through a radically different global redistribution and a new normal. The biggest actions we took were placing a large but staged carbon tax, equivalent to about a 10% increase in gasoline price pre-2040. We also further limited coal for how environmentally destructive it can be, both in terms of CO2 and its other toxic or hard to handle emissions, allowing natural gas to become an affordable driving force for developing countries' development. We believe strongly in renewables and electrification and took measures in methane and carbon removal that integrate smoothly with existing infrastructure most importantly, we made sure that our plan can pay for itself. Okay, uh, I'll give you five seconds to wrap, wrap up. Okay. Um, so this was a case study we did in the United States that showed that our carbon tax can triple electromass transportation, impair entire renewable energy subsidy, and double the department of ending university scholarships for the next 20 years. Thank Perfect. you for uh, listening to our presentation and we hope you pull on the 19th lever. All right, thank you, Team 19. Uh, okay. Um, do, 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 do. Team 23. Okay, uh, hello. We are Stanfordable Energy. So, just in terms of a quick big picture overview of our scenario, uh, we are projected to achieve a global temperature change of two degrees Celsius by 2100 in accordance with the Paris Agreement. 
Um, we don't quite reach net zero total greenhouse gas emissions, but we are on pace to achieve it soon after 2100. And finally, the three most prominent long-term sources of energy as projected by our model will be renewable, new technology, and nuclear power, respectively. We took an approach of seeing energy as essentially an essential good. And so there were some key optimization objectives that we looked at while creating our scenario. While taking or having these in mind, some of the key levers that we worked on is having a slow um, wind down of coal, low natural gas and biofuels adoption, as well as ensuring that the market price of electricity remains accessible to all in the world. Uh, the losers in our scenario are industries and nations that rely on or invest greatly in energy sources that we tax heavily, which includes the Petro States, the Developing World, and China's Belt and Road Initiative, amongst others. Um, our winners are those that benefit from investment in green infrastructure and a more protected environment, including cities and the healthcare industry. Now, just wrapping around this, we found that it was fairly easy to go down to about 2.3, 2.4 degrees with very um, realistic measures um, that are already being worked on today. But the last tenths of a degree um, were much more difficult to um, do. So after going through a lot of the levers, we did some realism checks to ensure that none of the ideas that we implemented in the model were out there. Um, Implementing what we have in the scenario will definitely take a consolidated international effort and will take a lot of work. But from the research we've done both on the learning curves of different technologies, technological developments, as well as some of the other aspects such as the societal costs of carbon, we think that the measures are realistic to achieve and that leaves us very hopeful that we can achieve the two degrees if there is a consorted effort around the world. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, team two. Um, okay, so before I start, I just wanted to say thank you to the whole team for putting this together. Um, and uh, here I go. So our plan is called Phase Carbon Reduction and Renewables Advancement. So some, of course, we were able to reach two degrees C, uh, some high level concepts. Uh, we, like other teams, wanted to phase out carbon gradually and focus on renewable energy and other sustainability technologies in uh, research and development. So I actually think it's more effective to show you our scenario and a timeline. Uh, we begin phasing out carbon first with a moderate carbon tax. Um, and this gives time uh, for uh, legacy companies to uh, prepare for our uh, 2030, 2040, and 2055 ceasing of building infrastructure. Uh, to emphasize, this doesn't mean they can't stop using their existing infrastructure. So they still have time to use it, but they just have to, instead of investing in new infrastructure, they invest in renewable energy technology. Uh, simultaneously, um, we are subsidizing natural gas and uh, renewables, bioenergy, and nuclear uh, from 2020 to 2060 to incentivize these companies to make the shift to renewable energy. Um, we also have to implement various other uh, moderate policies in the year 2030 in order to actually reach two degrees C. Um, a big one was methane, N2O, and F gases regulation, as well as afforestation. We are pretty aggressive about carbon removal. And we also did use a technological breakthrough, a new technology in, in the year 2065, but it was not necessary to reach two degrees C, nor was it necessary for our plan to be economical. Uh, speaking of, our plan does pay for itself for the majority of its lifetime, uh, the excess money we want to invest in R&D. You can see we first phase out carbon, then oil, then natural gas, and that's purely based on the carbon intensities of these sources. And uh, the graph on the right, you can see this is what the consumer will see. So there is a slight increase in market price of electricity, but it does not reach uh, uh, above 2000 levels. And the new technology we implement uh, is not, is, yeah, last sentence, is not required uh, to achieve uh, below business as usual case, um, but it does help a little bit. So there we go. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks to all the teams. Um, so now we'll have our discussion. Um, and so I am going to uh, pass it over to um, Sally Benson and Drew Jones to help uh, lead us in that. And I'll be managing uh, the Q&A for students. We want this to be a discussion. So please feel free to raise your hands or um, ask questions in the chat and we'll, we'll uh, get to those as well. Okay, terrific. Hi, this is Sally. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can, yes. Yeah. Okay. So maybe Drew, we'll we'll start with you. Do you have uh, questions for the the three teams? Yeah, thanks. 
Hey, Sally. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. Hey, everybody. Um, first, I just got to say, Janet and I were blown away with what an amazing job you've done with the model. Nobody has done such detailed, intricate, elaborate, interesting scenarios as you guys. It's just, they're amazing. So, and the, the graphics around it, like team two, that last thing with the timeline, no one's ever done a timeline on that. No one has filled the whole screen of actions and outcomes map that you saw with 53 lever moves. So just acknowledging what you guys did. As I said, nobody and thousands of people around the world use this model. No one's gotten into it that much. Um, so congratulations. We're excited to see what it could do. We didn't know. Um, I think the big question is for you three, you know, we're optimizing for climate. We want two degrees and yet we can't have our policies hurt particularly marginalized communities. Uh, poor people are getting poorer around the world. Rich people are getting richer. What did you think about and what did you do to make sure that with energy prices or with other environmental considerations or side effects as they call them, how did you think about how not to hurt the people whom we're trying to help with climate justice actions in the near term, like here next week, if, as these policies get implemented? I'm curious, yeah, so can we do it that way? Like ask you guys questions? Is that, yes, that's, that's, that's the deal? That's the plan. Yeah, so I would say really briefly, I'm curious, what did you do to make sure you don't hurt particularly poor folks in the near term? I can answer the question from T19's perspective. Um, if that's okay. Go for it. So I think um, our proposal, the way that we tried to minimize the impact on the lower income neighborhoods was primarily twofold. The first was um, the fact that we made sure our carbon tax um, would be able to pay for advanced electric mass, electric mass transportation infrastructure. So the 10% increase in fuel prices corresponds, um, gas has about the price elasticity of minus uh, 0.6. That corresponds in the long term to about a 6% drop in how much people are, are trying to use gasoline to transport themselves. So we replaced that and tripled our electric mass transportation infrastructure to make sure that people are still able to go where they need to go. Um, the second stage of our plan was relying on natural gas. So natural gas is really cheap, cheaper to transport over short distances. And many developing nations are in areas where they have natural gas resources. Um, so they have this uh, resource available to them. They just don't have the incentive right now with oil prices so cheap to make that transition. So being able to stage up, do a stage tax for us um, for carbon helped it, would help incentivize them to look into natural gas until 2040, um, at which point um, essentially it becomes like a intermediary technology where they're kind of phasing out the uh, carbon heavy oil and coal and giving time until electrification really reaches economical regions for them. Thanks. Yeah, um, I can take the question for team two. Uh, I'll put my, if I can, um, can I put my timeline back on? Sure. It, great. Um, so yeah, so we were, we, we thought a lot about um, developing countries and uh, they're actually one of our primary concerns. So we, first of all, we implemented a very moderate carbon tax. Uh, you can see it's only rated as a medium uh, while also incentivizing natural gas immediately. So the idea there is we wanted to shift uh, developing countries from uh, coal to natural gas for about a 20 year period. Um, at the same time, we never, we didn't want to put them in a situation where they felt as if their existing infrastructure would be compromised um, either by telling them that you can't use it, uh, which we did not do, um, or by implementing a carbon tax that would be uh, that, that would make it uneconomical uh, to use their existing infrastructure. So uh, instead, we staged the ceasing of infrastructure and allowed their existing infrastructure to die out over their natural life cycles, um, and. And ultimately, we are confident in technological improvements. We see the vast amount of um, time and energy that's being put in from universities like Stanford and others across the world. Um, 
in renewable energy technologies. And uh, we believe, and we look at trends in the industry, that those technologies will become cheaper, even for developing countries. Uh, we wanted to give humanity enough time to make those improvements, so we delayed it till 2050. But there's even evidence that uh, in some situations, the technologies are cheaper now. Um, so we felt pretty confident about that. And, and we, are, um, uh, we are ultimately uh, uh, displaying our comp through our plan, we're ultimately displaying the confidence um, in improvements in technology. And we're buying time for it with our plan as well. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay, does the other group want to answer yep. the question as well? I'll jump in here for group 23. Um, I, I think a lot of the points have actually been mentioned already. So we've taken a, a largely similar approach in that we have natural gas um, coming in temporarily as a stopgap measure. However, we've also tried to not um, overemphasize it largely because it's been shown to have um, disproportionately negative effects on less well off or less socioeconomically developed um, regions, um, particularly in the exploitation. Um, so that's one side of it where we're a bit careful. Um, one hope there is that um, with a lot of the developments that are going on, um, especially in getting the cost down of renewables as well as hydrogen, um, that going into 2030 to 2040, uh, we can start phasing that out. And so if looking at our engine mix, that's um, where both oil, coal and gas um, start slowly phasing out around that time. Um, and then another measure has largely just been focused around cost. How can we ensure that um, we have a market price around the world that is accessible to everyone, even in regions where um, they are less well off? Um, the increasing adoption of renewables where, uh, so I think yesterday we had the example that in Portugal, the first project has been developed for wind, um, where the energy price has fallen to one cent per kilowatt hour. Um, which is incredible when you compare it to um, traditional prices. So I'm very hopeful that with the renewables um, ramping up starting around about 2030, we can have a significant shift where um, the energy costs also drop, particularly in regions that are building new infrastructure now. So looking at the more developing regions of the world. And of course, ensuring that the is, uh, existing infrastructure on the coal side doesn't need to be turned off. So similar to group two, uh, ensuring that it can be used to the end of life. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so maybe we'll uh, we'll uh, give uh, Arun a chance to uh, ask a question to uh, to the to the group, or either specifically to one group or something for all of them as well. Frankly, uh, I'm just impressed by the amount of thinking that has gone behind this, and and gives me hope that we don't have to do the draconian things that we have that a lot of people are proposing, but there could be a transition to something that is much more palatable, frankly, uh, around the world. And this is not just for developing countries, and, uh, but including the world. And, and if I look at, you, know, you mentioned the one cent a kilowatt hour, we just heard on Tuesday this morning, um, one of the Chinese entrepreneurs who makes wind turbine, he said he's predicting one cent a kilowatt hour. So this is uh, not just prediction anymore, but this is real. And so it's very, very hopeful. So that's all I'll say. Thank you very much. This is fascinating. Good okay. Do you have Do you have any questions for the group, or or not at this moment? No, not at this moment. Yeah. Okay. So, so I have a question for all of you then. Um, so I was not clear, um, probably just because it went by way too quickly for me. Uh, what was the the total energy that you're using in in uh, twenty twenty one hundred? Or 2050, either one, and how how is that relative to the uh, total total energy available Ooh. today? I can take this one for uh, 23. Um, so in 2100, we are looking at about uh, 400 exojoules per year, um, and and the reason for that is because we actually predict because obviously one of the things we've talked about a lot in this um, in in this uh, conference has been that we need to almost double. Um, the amount of energy that we have available right now for the long-term effects. Um, but ours doesn't, obviously our scenario doesn't do that. And the reason for that is that we predicted actually somewhat of a uh, slower economic growth than would be expected with the status quo. And our reasoning for that was obviously partly because of the pandemic, but more because of what we're seeing with a growing technological divide between um, American digital infrastructure and Chinese digital infrastructure. So if you look at like 
long-term economic effects of those kind of sanctions and um, maybe, uh, and, and I'm sorry, anyway, uh, if we look at the long-term effects of, of sanctions between the two nations and growing hostilities and the effect that that plays on a global economic uh, market, as well as, you know, obviously intermediaries like the EU and Latin America and Africa having to almost take sides in effect as we're seeing right now with Britain um, and Huawei, I think that we, we project lower economic growth growth, and, and, and therefore we see just around 400 exojoules per year meeting all of the needs that we have long term. Okay, great. Uh, how about stand portable energy? That we are stand portable energy. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Whoops. Okay. How about 19th lever? Yep, I can answer the question for the 19th lever. Um, so I just drew the graph right now. Um, so we're using about, oh, oh, sorry, spotlight. I thought that, so that was muted. About 450 exajoules per year by 2050 and about 700 exajoules per year by 2100. So we had, um, uh, like we definitely thought through the same concerns that um, Team Sam Portable did, but we also thought of the alternative issue that um, electrification has a very noticeable effect to increase GDP uh, per capita of developing nations. Um, I've seen it personally in my own country of Pakistan, and it's been measured widely across the other regions. So we thought that kind of counterposing this economic um, slump of COVID-19 as we tried to expand electrification, and our group was very enthusiastic about electrification as a solution, um, the amount of energy consumption is just going to increase. So uh, we saw kind of a tripling um, of energy usage. Okay, all right. Um, and then how about phased reduction? What was your total energy? Great. Um, so yeah, you can see the graph here. Uh, we do deviate from business as usual case. Um, unlike the first group, uh, we did not touch population nor economic growth. Um, we wanted to limit ourselves and, and, and take on the challenge of saying, okay, let's say that th this is actually true. Uh, can we innovate around that? Um, so the real reason for deviation uh, from the business as usual case is increase in energy efficiency. So we do have moderate uh, increase in the efficiency of vehicles, buildings, uh, industrial equipment. Um, and that really is just in the theme of our entire scenario, which says, uh, let's buy time uh, for innovators to not make giant, uh, giant breakthroughs, but to continue on the trends of improvement that we've been witnessing over the last uh, few decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. So all of your um, uh, energy demands are really low. Um, and uh, I mean, it, that's, they're sort of in the order of 50 exajoules per year today, uh, 50, 50, I'm sorry, 50 gigajoules per person per year, which is um, basically the sort of same level. Well, the, the global average is actually higher today than that. And, you know, if you look at sort of the amount of energy that we think where you see a, a big deviation from the perspective of the human, de, uh, human development index, it's around 100 uh, gigajoules per person per year. So, um, so, yeah, so you guys are all pretty aggressive on efficiency, which, which is great. Um, I guess I'm a little bit worried that uh, people aren't going to have the energy they, they need. So, for example, the people in the U.S. would have to go from 300 uh, down to say 50, you know, that's like a pretty draconian uh, cut in total energy. Um, okay, may maybe we'll do one more round of us and then we'll open it up to everybody. So Drew, do you have, uh, do you have some more questions? There's a distinction between deployment of what exists today and aspiration to what might be possible technologically in the future. What would be the, the place that you're the most wary of your own proposal, given what you're counting on for the future that doesn't exist? And I know this isn't the kind of thing like, I don't know if you can answer right away, but take a moment to think of it. Like, what is the bet that you're making that feels to you the most challenging? Kind of like Sally was just pointing at, are you really sure we're gonna be able to have energy efficiency gains like that? What would be the technological or 
uh, future bet that you're the most suspicious of, where if you were a skeptic of your scenario, you would say, wait, 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 what about that? How did you count on that to get you from 2.2 to 2.0? Where are you the most wary of your own scenario regarding technological optimism? And can you identify when you speak by like the name of your group? Because that's how I think of you, not by your name. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to go first. Um, so we are uh, team two uh, phased carbon reduction and renewables advancement. Um, so I think there are two places, if I was a skeptic in approaching our scenario, uh, there'd be two places. Um, one, and this is something our group talked about at length and had pretty healthy debates about, is the sheer power of uh, these legacy companies, uh, fossil fuel companies, um, and uh, being able to pass anything that uh, in the immediate that could um, negatively impact um, their businesses, um, such as an yeah. immediate carbon price um, and the ceasing of uh, building new infrastructure, I think would be a challenge. Um, yeah. And to answer your question, which I think uh, you were directing more towards from a technology perspective, we were pretty moderate in most of our uh, technology projections. Um, I would say the one that uh, the one that we banked on the most that I'm probably most skeptical of uh, would be the carbon removal technology slider. Uh, it is still at medium growth, but at the higher end of it, um, as you can see here. Um, and I think the reason we went that way is because uh, there's, a, there's, I believe, uh, from what I understand from the industry, um, and, and we as a group believe that there's a lot of growth opportunity there, that like we're kind of starting um, from a point uh, where we're, we're kind of at the beginning now. Um, whereas uh, technologies like solar and wind, uh, we've been innovating in that space uh, for a very long time and we've already seen drastic improvements. Um, so I think there's uh, a great potential for even more improvements um, for technological carbon removal from, from the atmosphere. Piggybacking on what I had already, what I already kind of shared on our group, you can see my screen here, right? So, so you can see kind of all the graphs. Uh, so I think there are three areas that we're a little bit um, cognizant about. Um, the first is, um, the first two are on technology. Uh, so we're bullish on technology, but we're betting on technology here that hasn't been proven yet. And probably on learning curves that are faster in some places than what we, we've seen so far. Uh, two areas in particular, the first around carbon removal. We are very aggressive in carbon removal. Um, and I think that things like biocar can um, go, go to full potential. Um, and you can see in one of the graphs actually that um, we have net negative emissions, a uh, big part of net negative emissions here uh, at the end. And that's a really important way kind of the second half of the century to, to, to get the temperature down to, to not have to increase anymore what we still increase over the next next 20 years or so. Second, um, we're very bullish on the further uh, technological uh, advancements in renewables, in particular on storage. Uh, so we're embedding very big on renewables um, and that requires storage to be viable. Uh, and and a big unknown from what we've heard also this week, although a lot of people are working on it. Um, and third, uh, and going back to, I think, a um, a, a, a question that, 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 that was asked before. Uh, our cost of energy goes up quite a bit in the short run. You can see that here. And that's because of a, a decent carbon price in the uh, 40, around uh, $40 um, per ton in the, in the medium, actually 2040, and much higher of the 350 later. Um, and that politically, of course, um, does give us some doubt as well. Um, so, so, so we think being honest about our, uh, about our, uh, we, we think, of course, technically it makes sense, uh, but politically, um, and going back to Drew's first question, uh, you, you do need a new world order on redistribution to probably make this happen uh, in a concerted effort. And, and the, uh, the, the world has not yet demonstrated they can do that. So, so could you just uh, let me know, like, what is the size of your um, carbon dioxide removal? How many gigatons a year? I can't read that. Yeah. Say by, uh, by, by 2050, right? right? Yeah, okay. So it's about 10 uh, starting in 2050. Oh, 10 in 2050. Okay. Would love your feedback on that because it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> <for us. laughs> 
Yeah, it's amb it's ambitious, it's but ambitious, probably yeah. not uh, not out of the realm of possibilities. Yeah, no, we one of one of our guiding principles is you know we really have to bet on technology to get us through uh, this human caused um, challenge, right? Uh, so so we are being aggressive on that end. Okay. Thank you. Does the nineteenth lever wanna? This, that was us. So somewhere else. Yeah. This. Uh... The last one, group 23, I'll take that one. Uh, let me just see if I can share as well. Uh, you should be able to see my screen. So uh, I think for us, there's a few factors. So going away from technology, the biggest one or the biggest assumption is on uh, in general policies being implemented. Um, we've been rather bullish on policies being implemented by 2025 uh, across the board. And so that takes a, a strong concerted effort globally. Um, um, I think that would be the largest question mark um, going both in the direction of, um, you know, what's being taxed, um, carbon pricing and so on. Um, so we see your screen, but it's a blank white screen. Um, that's unfortunate. Let me try again. It, how about now? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so that's um, one thing being the policies. Second one, carbon price. Um, we've implemented a carbon price that we think is um, doable, starting at $40 and then um, towards the end. So it's of 2080 going up towards $80, gradually rising. Um, however, um, again, sort of looking on a global scale, implementing uh, carbon pricing schemes, Very strong effort. Um, the airline industry is only just implementing a scheme that's global starting next year. And that's taken them uh, since the early 2000s to really uh, when they start working on it. So again, um, you know, a lot of international push needed there. Um, two other levers that are significant on ours, we mentioned it earlier, um, the growth. Um, but um, th then looking at sort of purely technology to go back to the question, um, we were also very bullish on energy storage to push renewables and um, there um, we've assumed quite a significant cost um, decrease over the next years, which seems to be in line with uh, current trends. However, also doing a sensitivity on that doesn't actually change um, the overall picture too much, except for the market price of energy. And so that's a significant one to look out for, especially when we're talking about equity of implementation. Um, and also looking at uh, new technologies being implemented. Again, we have new technologies um, that we think could be realistically um, available in 2030 and then start coming online around 2040. Um, also doing a sensitivity on that, um, even if it's only in 2080, it doesn't change too much. However, um, if too many of these assumptions fall, all of a sudden you have a big uh, rippling effect. So yeah. again, there on the new technology side, um, quite a lot of, or we're quite bullish that things will happen um, from thorium uh, to nuclear fusion, but um, there is a lot of work and a lot of uncertainty to be dealt with. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, so uh, Arun, do you, uh, do you have anything you'd like to ask now or should we open it up to the rest of the uh, class? A quick question. I mean, if since you have all worked on this, are there any sort of common understanding of what are the breakthroughs that are needed, if any? First of all, do you think there are needed any there any breakthroughs needed in technology, and if so, what are those? So I think for twenty three, one thing we discussed briefly, and that also came out of one of these sessions, is long term energy storage. Um, looking at um, SOC catalyzers, so being able to um, produce hydrogen um, from re renewable energy at a cost that is competitive. Um, the trend that was presented yesterday by um, Stefan Reichelstein um, also supported that um, being in progress. So I think that's a key enabler that's really needed um, for having such a strong renewables presence, also when with the seasonal fluctuations in mind. Um, I can speak for T19. Um, so I think in addition to technology, or aside from technology, all three of us groups also did a heavy uh, carbon tax, um, which 
was unfortunate, but it seems to be a strong policy that at least all three of our groups has implemented um, kind of a necessary evil to achieve two degrees. Uh, speaking on technology, on our side, um, smart building infrastructure uh, was con essentially crucial to long-term um, energy or electricity decreasing. Essentially by 2100, uh, I'm trying to get the graph up. I, I can share my screen. By 2100, essentially buildings and industry electric took up the vast majority of our final energy consumption. So um, achieving better energy efficiency um, will be crucial in order to properly bring this down. Um, it's a large sector by its nature, but smart building technology, um, the IoT for a smart infrastructure, um, I believe that the sort of connected technology is going to be crucial for long-term growth. So energy efficiency, energy storage with its hydrogen or perhaps other long-term storage. And uh, also perhaps uh, I, I heard carbon removal. Did, did we hear that? I think there was some aggressive goals for, for that. And w would people agree that that is something important or do you, th you don't think breakthroughs are needed in that? For us, carbon removal was more of a long-term solution than something that can really help us um, right now. So for our team, we achieved 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide removal per year, but we're currently producing 40 gigatons of carbon removal. So this isn't going to be kind of a break all solution or like a magic bullet to bring us to zero. Um, it's going to be kind of a long-term solution in our scenario that once we've actually properly reduced carbon uh, emissions, uh, carbon removal can start to take over after that. Right. Uh, so I do want to jump in and answer uh, both questions. They are related. Um, and put up our presentation in the meantime. Um, so a few things. I do, I definitely agree that uh, storage, whether in the form of batteries, hydrogen, or uh, some other means, uh, will be very critical moving forward uh, if we are going to be so reliant on renewables, particularly solar and wind, that are naturally intermittent sources. Um, and other than that, um, my gut reaction to this question is that um, it's really going to be a contribution in all sectors. Uh, it's funny, uh, that's probably the one thing that I've learned the most from this experience. Um, coming into Stanford, I really wanted to create a new technology and like make, me, uh, make a significant impact in this challenge, uh, which obviously I still want to do, but um, I've come to realize how important the contributions of every sector will be. and. Uh, it's kind of like a throw the entire kitchen sink at this problem because um, that's how big the problem is. Um, and yeah, so uh, that that would be my uh, my big takeaway. And, and in addition, um, it was also interesting to me that uh, if you did implement a new tech, a completely new technology, uh, that that many times wasn't the most effective way of um, reaching two degrees C, it actually had very small impacts. In our case, um, no impact on emissions or on, uh, on temperature, uh, just more of an economic impact. Um, and I think that's because of the model takes into account the amount of time it would take to commercialize. And so there really has to be, of course, a new technology would be great, uh, but I think there needs to be an emphasis on developing the technologies we already have as well. Okay, so just raise your hand and uh, and I will call on you. So it, and and I really do want to get reactions like for you know like you've heard these proposals like you go oh heck no that's not going to be right where your where your own scenario is very very different and yeah love to yeah okay um um Mayank uh, you go first yeah did I get your name right yeah. You did, Sally. Thank you very much. It's like my uncle, but without the LE at the end. So my uncle, perfect. Um, so I have a technical background, engineering by academia, and I've been working in finance for close to two decades. So I came at this in a very objective manner. What I was surprised about was 
how emotional a ride it actually was going through the simulator. And as we went through it, there were some certain surprises, and I think a lot of the other teams saw this as well, that some of the actions we assumed outright would have a great impact didn't. Um, and I think Josh just alluded to it, that you need, you need to throw the kitchen sink at it. There's no single magic bullet. So I guess the question for me, for the teams was, how did it make you feel? Because at some point we were surprised, concerned, alarmed, but now we feel optimistic, committed, and confident. So it's been a great experience, but it, it was more from the emotional side than more the more objective side that I was expecting. I can definitely answer, or I can answer for Team 19, the 19th lever on my side. Um, so if you don't mind me sharing my screen once again, um, I can show an example for where I ran into that controversy as kind of a, an electrical engineer. Um, so one thing that we noticed that um, was that electrification is definitely crucial for um, achieving two degrees. But that said, renewable stuff like solar panel technology, um, it's really hard to increase the efficiency of that. So as like an electrical engineer, I was coming into it thinking, okay, let's just um, replace all the land that we deforest, put a solar panel everywhere, and we've solved the problem. But it's not that easy. Um, and when you start to quantify things like what does a large carbon tax mean? Oh, it means 10% increase in gas prices. Uh, if you compare that to the um, Arab um, kind of MENA embargoes from two years ago, what actually uh, difference does that make on livelihood? Uh, so that was definitely an emotional struggle. Uh, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to put the numbers on it. Like we did a whole case study on what does our policy do to the United States. Um, but trying to conceive of what does that mean um, for real people and real scenarios, that's definitely been an emotional journey for me, thinking um, what does energy optimization mean in the real world? So I really enjoyed this um, and rose competition as a means to see and transverse that gap. I think uh, speaking for Team Stand Portable Energy, you know, you talked about the emotions behind the experience. And I think one of the things we definitely experienced was, you know, on that first pass through when we were playing with all the detailed, all the detailed mechanics, we were really looking at like, okay, we want to be realistic. We want to really capture something that can potentially happen, that we could potentially achieve this goal in a realistic scenario, not by us just like, well, we got to go as high as we possibly can on carbon price or, you know, thorium breakthrough in five years. Um, and, you know, doing that, you get to, you know, in terms of greenhouse gases emitted and in terms of the global temperature increase, you get to around like 2.5, 2.4 degrees. And then, you know, moving on from there, when you start to play with it further, the sensitivities of the things that you implement just drop so substantially. So that at the beginning, when, you know, okay, it starts at 4.1 and you get to 3.4 without thinking, all of a sudden you're at 2.2 and you're playing with stuff and it just seems like you've got to, you know, tear yeah. a leg off to actually get down to the Paris Agreement and what we're actually trying to accomplish. And that, I think, was the most kind of frustrating and eye-opening part of the experience entirely for our team. Yeah. I can take it again for uh, team two. Um, I'm not sure if this is, a this is the last question, but I, before I answer the question, I wanted to uh, shout out the rest of my team. I've been slacking them with some answers as well. So this has been a really uh, big team effort. Uh, so thank you to Christina, Diego, McKenna and Kuhn. Um, I'll put some of our thoughts that we had um, on the screen, but to be honest, I'll just uh, speak from the heart and say that uh, for me, this was a uh, grounding experience um, in the sense that you really realize like, man, there's a lot of, a lot of things that need to happen uh, in order to uh, reach two degrees C, which is actually the bare minimum requirement. Really, uh, Paris Agreement uh, wants us to get to 1.5 degrees C. But it's also uh, inspiring uh, to the um, 117 people that are currently in, in the chat um, that there's a lot of work to be done. And when there's challenges, there's opportunities. Um, and we are the people at the front lines that uh, have the capacity to meet these challenges. Um, so it made me just wanna work. Uh, maybe it made me excited to start school next week and get started. Um.
Thank you all. So I'm going to pass uh, the, the voting on to uh, Jenny, um, but to aid in your voting, I'm going to put back up this slide um, to which I have added the, uh, the team names. Uh, so hopefully that will be helpful uh, in keeping, oops, I gotta get those out of the way, in keeping everybody straight. Um, and with that, uh, Jenny, uh, go ahead and uh, tell us what to do. For sure, so everyone has one vote. Um, you can vote for any team, including your own team. Um, then if you have presented, feel free to raise your hand using the raise hand button so that people can find the face uh, and match it with the name if you want to, if that helps you to vote. Um, so let's finish voting in the next uh, two to three minutes. Um, we'll see how many votes come in and then see, uh, let us know if you need more time. Um, but I think that should be enough time for us to vote. So I am very thrilled to announce as our winners, Team number two. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations to all.